I think Hujam, well, there were two important reasons behind this. One important reason was that that I see really a gap, a gap between the presentation of the Hijmat movement by the Hijmat scholars or the other scholars in the English literatures and my everyday interaction with the Hijmat volunteers, the larger periphery. I'm not saying about the intellectuals in that. So what I see is that, that the larger Hijmat volunteers in their day-to-day -day conduct life, they're very much guided by Islamic ethics, Islamic norms, uh, like guided by Fatehullah Gulen discourse, and they were very much 24 hours Muslims actually. And therefore I find that while the movement derives inspiration from the history of Islam, from the prophetic model, from the Sahaba model, but somehow uh, in terms of its representation in the English literature, the role of Islam has been de-emphasized. And this paradox I wanted to highlight actually, that there is a disjunction between representation and the actual situation actually. The second one that I do believe is that, that the movement has been relatively successful in negotiating and dealing and critically, reflexively engaging with the modern issues. It is precisely because it is a die-hard Islamic movement. I mean, it is not kind of liberal or a moderate on the others. Where? Because uh, it's precisely a die-hard Islamic because it is assured of Islamic identity. It is assured of Islamic faith and therefore it doesn't have any fear in engaging with the issues of the modernity as such. So that's why I emphasize. In a sense, no, it's not about that. It's like, for example, the Gandhian movement in India. Gandhi does not have the conception of other. You know, it is similarly I found in the Gulen movement because the movement did not emerge against somebody. I have tried to interview many people actually. Like I asked them that, uh, how do you think and what do you think about Kamala Taturk? Because in the Muslim imagination, he was the one who has been seen someone that whose agenda was to finish off Islam in Turkey. That's a very powerful. So I would repeatedly ask this question. And I would also try to explore uh, Fatehullah Gulen position on Kamal Ataturk actually, because Kamal Ataturk has changed the entire history, I mean, to a large extent, identity and this and that. Invariably, the response would be, Hujam, the person who have really passed away, we do not make any comment. And that was very inclusive, Sunfi. If one person say it is okay, but if 50 persons are saying to you, that essentially mean that uh, you do not have a conception of other. And all uh, social theory like resource mobilizations or in everybody, there is this idea embedded that any social movement can really emerge unless you are against the state actually, or you are against that social group, or you are against, so you have a conception of other. This other could be political, this other could be social, this other could be some other kinds of groups. I really could not find in the Hijmat movement that there is a notion of other, it is against somebody. And, and, and this gets justified today after the crisis and what has happened in Turkey, which I basically describe as nothing less than the social and the economic genocide as long as this state has really targeted the one community. But even then the Hijmat is not in a position to demonstrate on the streets. Precisely one of the reason is that it doesn't have a conception of other. It till date because it doesn't have that capability to imagine Erdogan government or state on the others as an enemy of Hijmat movement. See, it doesn't have that perception and therefore it cannot hold the play card and on the streets. So it doesn't have that. So that is why that remarkable thing is that that since it doesn't have a conception of other, it doesn't fit into many kind of the Eurocentered social movement theories and this and that. And I think this is one that has been missed by the large number of discourse on the Hijmat movement. The somewhere they would put is that, for example, that this is against the White Turks and in alliance with the Erdogan against the White Turks. And once they marginalize White Turks, then they fought among each other. This is too simplistic proposition as such. I'm debunking this thesis actually. This is the most pervasive idea and one of the reasons why this is pervasive is that because the social science has been based on the power approach. This modern social science 
and and this essentially come because of the church state eurocentric kind of but then how would you look at gandhi in the power structure that's a fundamental question you know if you would have wish you would have become the prime minister but he did not aspire so there are people and there are a movement that not necessarily have the power orientation but then if you're looking from the modern social science perspective you would tend to see such movement as a as, as a kind of the power movement and try to portray that so uh, i have a problem with that thesis actually I think the fundamental differences between the two is that if you look at for example the 19th century experience of Islamic modernism or the reformist movement where the pressure came from the west to reform of the Islam as such and then suddenly you realize that we have to reform the political structures we have to reform the social structures and we have therefore what happened into the reformist movement is that that your structure of thinking was very much western so in the structure of thinking was very much structured all you wanted to use the islam as a justification to produce any kind of the reform actually whereas and as a result what happened is that that the islamic modernism or islamic reformism of the 19th century it could not neither provide a very viable liberal model nor a viable islamic model as such you know so so the model basically got collapse in fact whereas in the islamic renewalist movement which is the basically a mujaddid tradition is that the idea here is basically is that you have to renew and if you have to renew as per the demand of the age or there is a famous saying that after 100 years one person will come and blah blah i don't believe so that's for sure but that is not for me is important the important thing here is that that here the attempt is that you basically celebrate the modern ideas or the dominant ideas of equality freedom liberty hard working disciplining friendly as the original foundational ideas of islam so you basically renew these ideas in a different form because uh, form is changing and the structures are changing so you have to renew it so you do not compromise anyway you know you do not reinterpret the islam in order to suit the modern context actually but rather uh, you present them as a as a foundational islamic value that was somehow been compromised over the years but that how the reality is and therefore i believe is that that people in the hijmat movement do not suffer from any kind of identity crisis i mean wherever they go actually you know they do not have this crisis whether there is islam being affected if they go to india or other places you know because they go with confidence you know and that's the basic difference between the renewalist and 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 and, and the islamic reformist movement so where are all islamic reformist movement invariably has ended up as a political movement there has been large number of the sufi movement the localize and this and that in the 18th and the 19th century but they did not have as much of the global presence as the hijmat movement is this and they were coming also from the mujaddid tradition that's for sure but they and therefore probably you know i mean uh, i mean i mean they can build with the association with the business and with the guilds and with the other things that i can see that but all other 20th century movements actually whether jamaat e islami variety muslim brotherhood varieties tablighi varieties dobandi varieties all others actually they basically form within the by and large in the saudi wahhabi kinds of the movements which are basically reformist kind of movement in fact i i do i do not have much idea but when i look at for example the hijmat movement then i found that uh, this four mujaddidi people or who has been hailed are extremely important for fatehullah gulen one was certainly the imam ghazali or uh, imam khalid or, uh, or imam rabbani and badi usama said nursi so i could clearly see that that line extend that any social movement or any religious movement that have some prescription for a social change has a political dimension to an extent the hijmat movement believes in creation of a golden generation and the golden generation means a generation of the leaderships in every walk of life 
therefore you hijmat also has a some kind of the ideal prescriptions which we society should have moved and it has own imagination of the good life to that extent it is certainly political not for sure that's for sure but it is not political in terms of it is not political or, or in terms of like seeking a share in power or for example because movement has remarkable social base but it did not venture around the idea of establishing a political party that's for sure sure so you became a social power but the point is that who designated you as a social power who is that agency did the movement itself declare that it is entering into the realm of social power it has come from the critique actually and it has come from the critique including the fukadian one because they cannot move beyond the power dynamics my problem is this one is that ho jam i try to understand this issue because invariably i pick up the book this debate will come for example that and it comes from badu zama said nursi and his compartmentalization of the faces in which you have this idea of the old said and you have a new said and you have a third said you know similar kind of a structure was being applied to fatehullah gulen when he moved to america then the old gulen and the new kind of the gulen my contention is that that the people like gandhi or people like fatehullah gul and these are basically a visionary people they do not change their perspective i mean they have a remarkable ethical and the moral visions so they do not compromise on the issue of ethics so it's not that fatehullah gul and develop a sensitivity with regard to the human rights or with regard to the women empowerment only when he moves to america and see liberalism and got influence if that would have been the case why he would talk in 70s about a dialogue when he very much they are actually dialogue has not come from america as such you know or for example this idea of uh, engaging with a secular education so i don't see this compartmentalization because the moment you will take a compartmentalization you somehow do not see a unity of vision in a person you 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 know this unity of vision is moving according to the tactics according to the strategy according to the faces but i see a remarkable unity of vision and all other components whether education whether it is a dialogue whether it's the university whether it's a promotion of democracy is a part of this unity of the visions change is basically happening that's for sure so there is a theological recognition of change which is very powerful actually and therefore Uh, Fatehullah Gulen would like to emphasize that education has to be a continuous process. Mark is, I mean, see, he's he's emphasizing every time it's a continuous process. So change is a continuous process, and education is a continuous process. So certain things will continue. Certain parts of Islamic tradition will be continuous. Certain things has change. you know so it is only with this continuous process you will be in a position to deal with the change in fact so that's i see actually that i don't see a contradiction between the two acts such i i don't think that the movement will disintegrate that's for sure that is pretty clear in my vision but you do see that i mean uh, this kinds of changes will take place where there's a demand for change so there's a demand of change within the hijmat if the hijmat is located in the west it's a different kind of democratic different kind of the framework and different kind of critical reasonings are basically operating the demand will not come from central asia the demand will not come from africa that's for sure the demand would certainly come for the transparency and democracy and the, the one is that there there is a pressure from the different agencies and also because of the a different generation have been raised is also the generation basically demands and hijmat has begun to uh, respond to this issue in a very meaningful way i mean there has been internal debates the only probably uh, reluctance is that what should be the scope of this transparency otherwise as far as the having transparency becoming transparency in the written code there is no debate on this the only debate is on the scope of the transparency how it should be 
done. So it has already adjusted to that reality to a large extent and sooner or later it will certainly get materialized in fact that's I see that. There is, I mean there is because like for example I'll give you this when I was in Germany the last last to last year I was conducting the interview and I had asked some of the Hijmat people's very very straight question that what is your position on the LGBT community <laughs> so they said you know that's fine they're the humans so I said okay, okay they are human and therefore I mean do you respect them or do you accept them or do you tolerate them these are the different positions as such and then finally I asked them that suppose that uh, if somebody is born in your family with that identity then what will be your position and then the good number of the responses same that the fact is that the, the Hijmat movement talks about the humanity, talks about the human right, that primarily we are the first human. I do not have any alternative but to accept them and accept them gladly and respect them even that gender is born in my family. So but this is the new generation I and mean, when I was in Turkey I talked to some of the senior people who now passed away actually you know, in a journalist writer foundation. I mean he was very reluctant, he said Hijmat can't. <laughs> Hijmat <laughs> cannot accept this, you know, maybe I can tolerate it, but I cannot accept it, you know, that's not possible. So that I see a generational shift, I mean, that I see. The Hijmat movement has to really address that uh, a new generation vision of a Hijmat movement, which demands more open, more transparency, more democratic, and then you have the old leadership that has been raised in a Turkey, and that has its own memory of development of Hijmat actually. So there is this two kinds of vision now. I think the Hijmat needs to really reconcile. Address this generational, intergenerational debate is really very important, yes. And, and the older leadership needs to also understand uh, the, the, the new demands and the new vision of this younger generation because this younger generation will move after 20 years in that position. That's from this point of view. As far as the other question that you put, which I could not answer at that, is a question of deturkification actually. I this use the term in two sense. One sense I use this term that since the movement has emerged in Turkey, so there will be certainly the preponderance, you know. But as and when the movement become goal global, the Hijmat movement have to take some conscious step to also ensure the representation from other culture tradition in order to become more global. So that's number one. So that's the deterrification. It's not that I'm against drugs in that process actually. The second one that I basically also realize is that that Hujam it is like this for example. You have a Wahhabi movement you know and because of the petrodollars and the other this local Wahhabi understanding of Islam today has become global and everywhere. Should Hijmat will do the same, that it will promote their local Turkish understanding of Hijmat and make it global? That's the question. But if one has to go through Fatehullah discourse of universalism, then probably you will have to champion the very plural view of Hijmat actually. And that is the process of deturkification. It's not that the state atrocities really began on on the Hijmat people in the wake of this failed military coup. It began after crops and right away, large number of people. So I was talking to the people and they would basically would say to me that if the Hijmat is Allah's movement, Allah will take care. That's number one actually. <laughs> and the second would say that um, I think is that this 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 is basically proof. This atrocity is basically proof that we are a good Muslim. So essentially, mean that you need a suffering in order to prove yourself that you are a good Muslim. You know that essentially means that you are justifying persecutions. Then, and the third is that 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 you will give me the example from the Islamic history. So as a result, for the first time, I realize is that that instead of protesting against this barbarity, against the protesting against, you do not have that language of a protest. You know, you do not have the right discourse actually. All you are trying to justify your position that this is something basically the God given, this is something we have gone somewhere wrong, we have deviated from the Islam and the God has basically punishes. So you are basically internalizing that victimhood. 
you know within yourself and that i found it little a uh, bit problematic but at the same time i also realize then religion plays a very dominant role in terms of healing you know and therefore there's a remarkable resilience also you know and and it is this this resilience and it is this healing factor that is badly needed in the time of crisis but all i would like to say is that as far as the periphery is concerned i can understand but if the leadership abandon the role of re- reason then i am afraid that the hijmat uh, will collapse because it is this fine balance and i am saying this particularly from the leadership point of view masses i can understand periphery i can understand but if the leader abandon that role is abandon its faith on the reason and on the very fine balance that the hijmat has they will lose it actually that's my concern no in a sense is that because the large number of the literature which is available on the hijmat movement they have presented the hijmat movement in a terms of civic social and a democratic movement someone who come from india is number one one is that ki while uh, hijmat was promoting a culture for becoming a pro european union as one of the most forefront that's for sure actually but hijmat did not produce any critical culture about the state so that's number one so you do not build democracy without any critical culture about the state actually so that's how i realize is that it's not something a right based actually it is just for example that uh, participating in the elections and the other things and that's how the democracy has been basically understood secondly is that uh, i think that that the framework of duty is inherent in any religious movement and to that extent it will be also inherent in hijmat movement because of its religious roots that's for sure but the moment you start playing a dominant or some kind of the role in public sphere the moment you start interacting with the state institutions the moment you start building the media institution the moment you become the visible in a public sphere then that requires that in order to build democracy you must build a discourse of the rights then you be, you must become the voice of marginalized people you must become the voice of the many other marginalized identities and you must present that case Uh, before the state what happened with hijmat in turkey which i realize is that it enter into the process of guiding political without becoming political and that's where i see the crisis is it's an structural issue ho ja it's not about an individual as such individual will be only difference of some degree some less some more actually but the point here essentially is that a state has its own consciousness so akp might be different from the kemalis but the moment enter into the state it enter into the shoes of kemalism right from the very beginning <laughs> you know and 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 akp was functioning only with that shoes so that is structure become alive in times of crisis because that state uh, doesn't have whenever the state face as any memory historically that's how it responded actually whether it's a kurdish challenges or other challenges or any other kinds so of very minor challenges actually and this is what erdogan did the same so it is not the individual problem you are focusing on the individual as said that will not help it is a deeper structural problem where the image of his state is some kind of sacred image is state is some kind of father where the people derive their identity from the state is by and large turkish people are very much statist to be honest so that's a deeper problem and since the hijmat to to my understanding did not build any critical culture any in any, any critical discourse about the state you can't democratize the state then and since the state has not been really democratized then whether it's an ardawan or whether tomorrow some baba jaan will come baba ka i don't know what's the name some other person will come or some other person will come they would all be inheriting the kemalist structures actually you know and that state has its own memory that state has its own consciousness actually you know and that consciousness and memory has been revealed through individual agency in this context it was ardawan in other context somebody else that's what i feel
much useful ho jaye i mean for example that and especially when we are living into the age of the information technology and a globalization this is not the age of 17th century where you can erase the memory that's not possible that's not that's in structural reasons the second is that for example is that ki what has happened in turkey i mean you have taken over the physical manifestation of hijmat but ideas travels on its own level ho jaye ideas travel in the past also i mean it travels from the from so from 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 the arabia to africa all kinds of ideas travel so that memory is very much global now you know and and that would keep circulating in fact you know and that is likely to shape many other kind of the islamic movement actually because this is very much possible actually you know that you can remain islamic you can remain secular you can remain modern actually and that's an experiment of islam with diversity pluralism recognition equality with the hijmat actually develop will certainly shape the future uh, not only the islamic movement but other kind of the social movement also that is i see that that, that is very much possible mm-hmm.